Hey, aloha, and welcome to Stand Energy Man on another beautiful day in Honolulu. In fact, today is so beautiful, it's a holiday. So I went surfing this morning for the first time in a long time, and it feels really, really good. So anyway, welcome to Stand Energy Man. I'm Stan Osterman from the Hawaii Center for Advanced Transportation Technologies. And we're going to start off today with um, an email that I got from a friend on the Big Island, introducing me to some videos from the University of Minnesota professor, Dr. Nate Huggins. I'm going to try and get him on my show sometime soon. I don't know when, but it can't be soon enough. I'll watch these videos several times, and I'll try to take his beautiful analysis of the connection between energy and economics and present them to you today. But you really should look at his videos, and they're going to be posted on, on um, the site there. So you can actually pull them down um, from the, from the uh, ThinkTech site when you go and look at the show here. Um, he says that we are all energy blind, and he's very, very correct. He makes the point that economic, economists don't have the en energy in any of their models, but the, he notes that there is a very close correlation between things like GDP and other critical economic data points and energy. And he tells, tells you why. And I'm going to try and, um, with some help today, tell you why also. So, for example, in Congress, there's uh, much talk about the Green, the Green New Deal. And some call it brilliant, and some call it kind of BS. And I hate to sound wishy-washy, but it's actually both. There's some changes on the, on the horizon that we can plan for. Um, and we can't we can plan for them or ignore them. And that's uh, the decline of cheap fossil fuel. You know, AOC has um, reacted in the, in the frame of climate change but at least she's got the part about quit burning fossil fuels right. It's not a matter of CO2 causing the world to heat up. It's not even a question of if we'll run out of fossil fuels, which is a scary thing many of, uh, for many industries today. But more a matter of when will it become too expensive to buy fossil fuels. Think of all the products made from oil. It's simply, it's, a, it's simple supply and demand. Right now, we're just burning it because it's like burning monopoly money. It's cheap, it's easy. Right now we have no other choices of energy other than fossil fuels. They're cheap and they're plentiful. We take the energy for granted, but when oil starts to hit $150 a barrel or more, and gas and diesel are up in excess of $20 a gallon, every single product and service on the global economy will feel the impact. And if we don't have alternatives, we're simply screwed. But are we going to give up travel? As my favorite Hawaiian senator said uh, recently to our colleague, so how will I get from my home state to Washington, D.C.? Apparently, Congresswoman Cortez missed the geographic uh, point that the 50th state in the U.S. has a 2,500-mile moat built around it. And if ships and airplanes aren't on the table, Hawaii has some huge issues to address. Like, who's going to stay in Waikiki? And how will I get my toilet paper? So the good side of the Green New Deal is that we need to face the reality that fossil fuels are too valuable to be burning for energy for very much longer. But the bad part is that if you don't understand the economic connection between energy and economics and what, and what it takes to get by today, you can really dork things up. We need a strategic plan, a transition to the future. An energy future that, that um, has fossil fuels uh, off the table and trying to transition them uh, is unrealistic, an unrealistic, on an unrealistic timeline is just not going to work. This means not letting the price points drive decisions for short-term short gains. So here's some of the links to the, to the shows, and we'll, 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 run them, we'll put them on the, on the website. But bottom line is, when I go to conferences and, and I talk about hydrogen and what it means to use hydrogen to store energy, a lot of people go, oh, it's too expensive and we can't do it right now because it's, it doesn't compete with fossil fuels. Well, the question is, are we going to wait for the price point so fossil fuels are, you know, more expensive than hydrogen before we start trying to replace over 100 years of electrical infrastructure and fossil fuel infrastructure? To make that change? The answer is I hope not, because I don't think our world economy can handle the shock. 
Anyway, on today's show, we'll talk about this with Mr. Ryan Wibbins, my favorite electrical engineer from Burns and McDonald. And Ryan, welcome to the show again. Yeah, so, thanks for having me. What do you think about, about that? Yeah, it's very important to, to look ahead if you're going to have a deep feeding resource uh, in the future on, on how you're going to replace that. Um, when, when we talk about it from an energy standpoint, we have to understand that to replace a generation source, we have to make something else. That, that part's easy, but it costs energy to replace it. Right. So just saying that we're going to replace our current generation because maybe the price at this point, it's getting too high. We are, we are losing the amount of resource we have, so demand is staying high, but supply is going down. That price gap will start to drive up the cost of energy. Okay, well, now we have expensive energy. We need to start replacing it. Well, to make the new stuff, it's going to cost more energy, more energy to, make the new, to make the new resource. A, a solar panel costs energy to make. The cost of energy, when you think about it from an economical standpoint, there is this uh, return on investment. There's this return on energy that, that you get when you make something. When we're using oil in the early days, you put your finger in the ground, it was like oil is just squirting out. Yep. Uh, as we know, that, that will get harder over time. When that exact point is, is going to happen is, is obviously debated. By, by many different people. I don't, I don't really care. I think everyone is saying, yeah, that eventually you could use it all, finite amount. So when we think about energy from like a, a return on energy that you get, think about it like there's a dollar on the ground. Picking up that dollar is very easy. Uh, you, you'll do that. There's even sometimes there's these calculations with multi-billionaire people, like, like Jeff Bezos or something, if he saw a $20 bill on the ground, it's not worth it's his not worth time. Not worth anything over. He's yeah. like, ah, ah, you know, <laughs> I got other stuff I can do to make more than $20. So for us, because I don't make billions or, or that kind of money, what if it's a quarter, a penny, yeah, half a penny? Exactly. You know, what if you got to bend down and try 100 times to pick up that penny? Are you going to do it? At some point, you're going to say, well, no, that's not worth my time. Energy is the same way. Uh, right now, you go into the ground and you pull something out. Um, the return on energy investment is something like a hundredfold uh, for for oil, um, and natural gas. That that can decrease if you go into different environments, something like Canada. It's it's a much lower threshold. Uh, it takes more energy to to get the energy out of the ground. Mm -hmm. It's still worth your time. Right now, um, that that metric will change. Uh, different technologies can help you out and help get you back to making it easier to go down and get that quarter or mm -hmm. to get that dollar. You know, I don't have to go 100 times to get that penny, but eventually, in theory, yeah, it'll, it'll become very difficult. Yeah, so, and, and right now, the U.S. is kind of focusing on our own internal sources of natural gas and, and oil, um, and we're actually kind of putting the kibosh on coal a little bit. So we have these resources available right now, and everybody thinks, well, we'll, we'll not run out of them. But when you look at um, how the future is shaping, um, the future is going to be electric transportation. So cars are going to start becoming electrified instead of fossil fuel. And you have this dynamic, and this is where this title of the show comes from, equal is not equivalent. You know, energy is, your first law of thermodynamics is like, you can have energy in all different forms. It never goes away. It just changes form. Mm -hmm. But you can't eat money. And you can't put dollar bills in a fuel tank in a gas engine and make it run. And you can't, you know, the different ways you have economic inputs and, and energy into a system matter. So right now, we're pretty much so focused on fossil fuels that we don't have that replacement. And as you mentioned, not only does the infrastructure get expensive as the price of your fossil fuel gets higher and higher and you're trying to bring in the new technology. Mm -hmm. But think of all the other associated industries. You know, we used to have thousands of people working a few acres of land to, to grow a crop. Now you have six people working a thousand acres of land and they have big combines and big equipment and they can do it. A family can run a thousand acre farm in the Midwest and make money on it and get it, and get it going. But that's five people. Well, big cities would starve to death if a bunch of those farmers couldn't farm for a couple of weeks because they didn't have oil or couldn't run their equipment. Mm -hmm. And those kind of relationships, I mean, you, you order your Amazon Prime, 
and expect the thing there the next day. Well, if airline prices go up higher and higher and air freight prices go up, pretty soon the cost of the freight to ship your stuff is going to be, like here in Hawaii it already is, more expensive than what you're buying. I've ordered some $30 worth of stuff and it cost me $30 to ship it. In fact, just last week I sent two envelopes to the mainland and express and it cost me $33 for one and $29 for the other one. And it was two envelopes. I mean, two, you know, yeah. legal size envelopes. It's like, there is so much economically tied to the cost of fuel today. And that insidious price rise is kind of blinding us to a potential disaster because the U.S. is doing well right now. We have a lot of our own resources and in Alaska, on the CONUS, in from Canada. Um, but we take them for granted. What if something happens where they're not available? You know, then what? And even just the incremental increase, are we going to wait until hydrogen is so much cheaper than fossil fuel that we start infrastructure? Then your formula kicks in where the infrastructure gets more and more expensive to replace it. You may never catch up. And the economic impact can be huge. Yeah, it, 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 can, it can be huge. And, the, and an imbalance is is a place that you don't want to be in, which is some of the driving reasons for us going back and relying on our own resources. We've experienced in our own history that when we, when we lose these, these lack of energy resources being imported, the, the amount of impact that it can have on our own economy. So looking back internal, yeah, that's one way to buffer yourself from that. But that just because there's not a political reason or, or or a physical reason that, you know, it can still come out of the ground. That it can, there are different ways natural disasters mm -hmm. being one that, that we can be cut off from our own supply uh, very, very quickly. And, and that, that'll, that imbalance is what would start to cause the problem. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and a, a, a true crisis will make you react. I mean, it definitely will. And, you know, nowadays the big crisis is climate change. Mm -hmm. and so I pulled this off the internet two days ago. So American so energy use surges despite climate change concerns. <laughs> what was that one more time? Energy, American energy use surges despite climate change concerns. Yeah. Right off the internet. I mean, with everybody talking climate change, with all the angst that Trump, President Trump got for pulling out of the Paris Accords, with all of the politicians jumping on and saying, we're going to tackle this ourselves. We're still using more energy. And like I said, with transportation, with uh, 5G coming on board, electricity is going to be more required in our, in our grid, in our system, to charge vehicles, to, to take care of a new technology that comes on board. So we're adding to the energy requirement. We're trying to transition to fossil free, you know, solar wind and things like that. And we're going to try and absorb the entire transportation sector and agriculture sector and everything else that uses fossil fuels. We can't be waiting, you know. But we don't need a crisis to hit us between the eyes. Mm -hmm. The economists should be picking up on this trend and, and, and letting stock market, you know, and, uh, and investors realize that we need to make this investment now to make it so that we have a stable market, things keep going about the way they do. And we're not reacting to a real crisis like, Boom, all of a sudden, Middle East gets in such a big turmoil that none of that oil is leaving anywhere because all the infrastructure is gone. And the whole world is vying for American oil or natural gas, and the price starts driving up. Sure. Yeah. So I had a, a very quick point I was going to make. We're, we love consuming energy. Mm -hmm. um, everything, everything new that comes to us is, is a great way for us to consume more energy. Uh, cell phones. If we just draw the line of how much energy a cell phone draws, it's, it's very little power. Plugging it into the wall for 30 minutes and it's charged up all day if you got a phone a lot better than mine. I'm more of a half-day kind of a guy. That, that's a little bit of energy. But now what are you doing with that phone? You're on the internet more. You're taking pictures and, and now all of our pictures are stored. Um, all of the emails being passed. All of this computing power that's being allowed to drive this is, is happening at, at large... Uh, data centers or these cloud-based computing yeah. places. These are energy monsters. Yeah. Now, now the, the people putting these in are, are becoming very um, aware and, and, and wanting to 
build in a, a renewable infrastructure around them. But that cell phone, those pictures you're taking, the emails you're sending, that's where the energy is being consumed by the computing power somewhere else, not just the little wall socket. And not just the computing power. By the air conditioning it takes to keep all that equipment cool that's because you can't let it get hot or it shuts down. Yep. But we're going to take a quick break here, and we'll be back in 60 seconds to talk a little bit more with Ryan Wilbin. Aloha and mabuhay. My name is Emmy Ortega Anderson, inviting you to join us every Tuesday here on Pinoy Power Hawaii with Think Tech Hawaii. We come to your home at 12 noon every Tuesday. We invite you to uh, listen, watch uh, for our mission of empowerment. We aim to enrich, enlighten, educate, entertain, and we hope to empower. Again, maraming. Salamat po, mabuhay, and aloha. Aloha, I'm Lauren Pear, a host here at Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you'd go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thanks so much. Hey, welcome back to Stan the Energy Man on a beautiful Friday here in Hawaii. Not on my lunch hour today, though, on my day off, which is even better. So, Ryan Wilbins, thanks for being here again. And Let's, um, let's pick up kind of where we left off. Uh, another, I used to this actually two, two weeks ago, I talked a little bit about this because I was still watching those videos from uh, Professor um, Hoggins. And he had a, a, a slide in there. And by the way, he's, he's kind of a farmer. He grows his own food and has his own property and stuff. He's pretty self-sufficient. But he had a, a picture of himself with a Dutch boy haircut and shorts and white legs and shoes and socks on, kind of comical. But he had a little one-tenth over his head. And behind him is his draft horse that he uses, he says, when he can get him to move, to do some of the work around the farm. So that horse represents one horsepower. And he represents one-tenth of one horsepower. And behind the horse is a quad, you know, a little side-by-side -side, um, vehicle, off-road vehicle that you can load stuff in the back and the two people can drive around. That's 45 horsepower. And then he had his truck, which I thought had more horsepower, but it's a diesel truck and has 150 horsepower. And he points out that, you know, back 200, 300 years ago, all we had was pretty much manual labor and animal labor. So we're talking one horsepower or less until you multiplied out the number of animals or people that you had working. And that's the max amount of energy you could get applied towards any kind of work, moving, uh, putting in fence posts, moving rocks, moving um, trailers or, or carts or things, um, just moving, moving yourself from point to point. But as the industrial age kicked in, now we had um, gasoline powered or coal powered uh, steam engines for like locomotives and trains and vehicles that, that all have this enormous amount of extra power. The ability to do a lot more work in a shorter period of time, which is, if you take the definition of horsepower, it's, it's a factor of amount of energy you have and amount of time uh, that you apply to doing work. You can get a lot more work done in a shorter time with a lot more horsepower. Well, what, he, what I didn't notice on that same slide, later on he actually adds an airplane, and that's 100,000 horsepower. So he says, next time you're flying across the U.S. and you're looking down at all the nice scenery, just realize that the energy it's taking to get you from point to point is massive, and you should be appreciating it and not just bitching about the price of the ticket because <laughs> it's, it's actually a, a lot of energy going into making that pretty much marvelous thing that the Wright brothers started off with 100 years ago into what it is today with four or 500 mile an hour transportation. So. When it comes to other modes of transportation, we talked a little bit offline about boats. And I sent you an article that I got uh, about some folks trying to look at electric ships. Mm -hmm. And you had some comments on that. What you, what... Yeah, the, when we talk energy and the amount of energy it takes to move, 
uh, to tie into our first half, we're saying that we love consuming energy, but right now we have this deep and high return on investment type of energy. So we are able to do things that are just amazing. When we want to look at what it would take to convert off of that, uh, we started talking about a, a ship and uh, an electric boat. When we get to a, a very large vessel, um, a containerized vessel, uh, so I, I had a, an article that I love because I, I like talking numbers, and, and we, we were talking about a little bit back and forth about the amount of energy actually consumed on a boat and in a diesel tank, and then comparing that to what it would be in our current battery format and seeing how those two compare. So do you have some of the numbers you yeah, can share actually, a little bit? Yeah, actually, this article, it has, and it's pretty concise here. So um, they're describing a current container ship that it's uh, they call the OOCL Hong Kong holds a record 21,413 40 foot containers and it cruises at the sl super slow steaming rate of 16 knots that's a fuel savings rate um, these ships can make the journey from Hong Kong to Hamburg Germany in 31 days so now they look at a brand new ship called the Yara, Yara Birklin it can carry 120 of those containers at a speed of six knots, and as far as it can go is 30 nautical miles. And it will carry, uh, let me see, the batteries it carries are seven to nine megawatt hours worth of energy stored. And the, the other ship, just by comparison, can carry 150 times the number of cargo containers, a distance of 400 times farther, at a speed of uh, twice over twice as fast but the weight penalty wait you, you can't possibly put that many batteries in a ship to move those distances and those speeds without taking all your other containers off but at a certain point all you're doing is driving a ship full of batteries and not a whole lot of cargo yeah just... so so that gives you a, like you say a good visual feel for how much density there is in the fossil fuels we use today that we take for granted. It's incredibly energy rich and that's what's what's done so well for us these past hundred years is 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 the easy return just I'm gonna grab something and use it and, and we're still in that time right now. Um, so we're looking at a, a ship that it would take hundred and fifty times less um, cargo and, and a, an absolute magnitude higher um, on the energy consumption. So we get into this problem where we'll say, yeah, we want to come off, we want to switch, but how are we going to do that? Well, that, that's a battery example, and batteries that, that we've been using, your, your double A's, triple A's, uh, even in, in some of the cars being used now, if you really want to get to what I would say, the, some of the larger use batteries, they, they have their, their use. Even on the grid, we have some use for batteries. But it, it's not... It's not our magic bullet. I mean, this is, this is some quick math. And, and even if you um, put in a learning curve on, on how much better can we get making batteries, there's a theoretical limit on, on how much better we're going to get. And we're not too far off of, of what that will be. That, that's chemistry and, and science getting in the way there. So it's, it's, it's not bad for that application. Mm -hmm. We need energy-dense in this case, energy dense transportable fuel. That's what's made the ship move right now. The other part that it is, is, is the cost aspect. We, we know that that's going to shift in the future. And that's when I, when I looked at this, I say, look, it, the battery is not going to be the energy medium for, for high energy dense transportable fuels. The, the math is not there. We said the hydrogen, hydrogen is, is close, if not more energy dense than diesel is so it's you you have a model that that can be proven uh just by energy now it's a matter of getting ready or being prepared for the economics mm -hmm. to shift and that's where they're not there right now i mean we're, we're, we're picking up quarters and dollar or twenty dollar bills off the ground right now not pennies what is going to make that shift well hopefully it's not a crisis I mean, hopefully it's something a little bit more planned that, that'll allow that um, change to mm -hmm. take place. But I, I think for, for hydrogen's goal, you can take incremental steps to get there right now. And exactly. I, I think reformation with, with natural gas making hydrogen is, is a very logical first step. Mm -hmm. Actually, mm -hmm. 
keep the price down for now and use the resource we're used to. Yeah. And it's still cleaner than burning fossil fuel, even though it's a fossil fuel they're starting with. Um, it's easier to sequester the carbon from that process and things like that. Maybe mm -hmm. use that carbon for carbon fiber and other things, nanostructures. But, you know, there's, there's some things happening right now. I just talked to a friend of mine who makes electrolyzers, and he says they've gotten the cost of manufacturing hydrogen from water and DC power down to about $10 a kilogram. Okay. Uh, $10 a kilogram, that's around five bucks a gallon, between four and five dollars a gallon. Well, we're not real far from that right now, and no. the, the price of gas creeping up over the summer could easily hit those kind of marks. So even if you talk about price point, we're right there already. And we probably that's a probably a good signal that we could start doing this. Another thing is we could look at hybrid vehicles and focus on them. We could also look at hydrogen in internal combustion engines. Now, there's, there's some tricks to doing that, and, and I've actually worked with some folks on doing that, and it's not easy. Most of the folks that try and use hydrogen in internal combustion engines run into hydrogen is energy dense by weight, but not by volume. So when you try and push enough hydrogen into a cylinder to give you the bang for the buck, it's really hard to do. But there are ways to do it. You have to change the dynamic in the engine. In other words, change the timing. You have to inject the hydrogen under pressure at the full stroke, detonate it in a um, stratified mixture, and make the engine work. And there's people doing that with diesel engines that actually get better performance out of the diesel engine with hydrogen than with diesel. So with all the internal combustion engines in the world today, there's a couple ways we can start transitioning to hydrogen. Internal combustion engines, converting them to hybrid, and you go straight to fuel cells. But they all involve hydrogen, and we probably ought to start looking at that. Yeah, that's very realistic. That's pretty neat. Uh, combustion engines drive just about everything yeah. right now, so um, the opportunities are, are everywhere. Yeah. Well, that's going to do it for this week in Stanley Energy, man. And thanks again to Ryan for being here on the show, and um, we'll see you next week. Aloha.